and her name is Carla Faye Tucker. Her life met a grisly and unforgiving end. Because after a widely publicized conversion to Christianity, she tested the limits of what society can forgive. But the brutal nature of her crimes made forgiveness almost impossible because Carla Faye Tucker used a pickaxe to murder two people during a burglary. So I suppose the first thing that I really wonder at this point already with this story is did you go to the robbery with the pickaxe as your means of, of robbing the place instead of a gun? Or was the pickaxe just there? You see what I'm saying? Like such an odd weapon of choice. If, that's, if that was a choice at all, we're going to find out. Born and raised in Houston, Texas, Carla was the youngest of three sisters. And like many of the most tragic stories, Carla's childhood wasn't good. Her dad worked as a longshoreman at the port of Houston, one of the world's largest ports. The hours were long, the work was very hard, and the pay wasn't great. Which eventually led to the marriage beginning to crumble. And this was hard on all three kids. Eventually, the stress became too much. Carla's parents filed for divorce, and to make matters much worse, a terrible secret was uncovered during the proceedings. At the age of 10, Carla learned that her father was not really her father. She was the product of her mother's extramarital affair. What had been an already tumultuous family dynamic turned poisonous. Perhaps it was no surprise that by the time she was 12, Carla had discovered sex and drugs. By the age of 14, she had dropped out of school altogether. Her mother had been a groupie during the rock and roll era, where Carla followed in her mother's footsteps, eventually paying for her bad habits by turning to sex work. She followed bands around the country. Some of the most famous musicians she had met at the time were the Eagles, the Allman Brothers, and the Marshall Tucker Band. It was a strange life for a teenage girl, but few people blinked. By the time Carla was 16, she enjoyed a brief burst of possible happiness. She married a man named Stephen Griffin, who was a mechanic, but the marriage didn't last long. So, of course, we've all heard stories of people that, you know, leave home at a young age because they feel better off without it. And she see I don't know, she was seeing the world, I guess you could you could say you could you could make the argument there where it's like, I ah, she didn't have really the the family that she wanted at that age and she was searching for that type of a relationship somewhere else. That's why he got married at sixteen. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. It makes sense that it didn't last very long, but at the same time, for legally to <laughs> allow that is bizarre. Carla's teenage years drew to a close in a hazy mess of drugs, sex, and many failed relationships. In her 20s, Carla began hanging around what you would call a biker gang. And through this gang, she was introduced to a couple. First, she met Sean Dean, who introduced Carla to her husband, Jerry Lynn Dean. They quickly became close. In 1981, the couple introduced Carla to their friend, Daniel Ryan Garrett. Everyone called him Danny. Now, even though Danny was 35 and Carla just 21, the two were smitten. They started dating almost immediately. The pair were strung out on drugs and desperate for cash. They didn't have any money, but they had an expensive habit. So one weekend, after Carla and Danny indulged in their drugs, they finally hatched a plan. They knew that Jerry Dean had assets 
that could be sold. They knew that there was a motorcycle, a particular model that Jerry had been restoring. It was worth more money than they could cobble together, and they wanted to take it. They wouldn't even need to break in. Sean had lost a set of keys a few weeks before, and Carla found them. I mean, is there anything more in the world that makes you say, hey, I don't think I'll ever introduce myself to a stranger in a restaurant, bar, social setting again? Because it seems as if these people barely knew each other, and somehow you're already taking keys that this dude loses? That's, cr that's premeditation at its finest, my friends. I mean, imagine losing keys and you find out a buddy gives them to you three weeks later. Sure, he might not have robbed you in that scenario, but at the same time, you're like, you certainly could have. Why else? Why the fuck would you take the keys? If you weren't up to something, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. That's bizarre. But let's continue on. So Carla and Danny decided to act. They thought they had the perfect way to sneak into the apartment without making a sound. Their plan was to sneak in to Jerry's home steal the classic motorcycle he was restoring. They thought they could even steal Jerry's car and make the most of the robbery. So in the early morning of Monday the 13th of June, 1983, Carla and Danny made their move. So once they had it, they had to sell it to a buyer. They brought a friend with them, James Librant, to make sure that they weren't outnumbered. As they walked down the street in Houston, Librant hung back. He went searching for Jerry's El Camino. It was another vehicle they thought they could steal. Meanwhile, Carla and Danny snuck into Jerry's apartment. The lost keys opened the door without a problem. Once they were in the house, they acted fast. Carla and Danny went straight for the bedroom. It was three o'clock in the morning, and Jerry was asleep. Before he could wake up and figure out what was happening, Carla leapt onto him and pinned him. But Jerry was a big guy, and he wasn't going to back down. Jerry grabbed Carla by the upper arm and tried to throw her away. This is when Danny scrambled around for a way to end the fight. Because at this point, everything was going wrong. His toe kicked against the ball peen hammer, which happened to be lying on the floor. Danny grabbed the hammer and lunged forward. Okay, such a weird thing to just be sitting in the room, right? A ball peen hammer just on the floor. How convenient. But the fact that that as soon as they go in, they go directly to the bedroom. She immediately jumps on top of him. Tells me that they had more plans of killing this guy than just robbing him. And if you see the photos of this guy, Jerry, that they're going to rob, he looks intimidating. He looks like a big guy. So, to somehow believe that there was... A hammer just laying around in his bedroom doesn't really add up. <laughs> so it makes me question even more that there's a pickaxe just hanging about. Let's continue on. Danny came down hard on the back of Jerry's head. He was out cold. Carla stood by, shocked. Jerry began making gurgling noises. Blood was everywhere. Jerry's body was twitching, his mouth spluttering incoherently. Carla could only watch. Danny left the bedroom and began collecting together any spare motorcycle parts he might be able to sell. But the sound of Jerry began to eat away at Carla. Jerry wouldn't stop. He gurgled. The blood flowed. Carla felt her whole body erupt in terrified fury. 
As Danny continued to steal as much as he could, she wandered through the apartment in a daze. And somewhere in that apartment, she found a three-foot pickaxe. Grabbing hold of the axe, she returned to the bedroom. Jerry was still there. Still alive. And she wanted to shut him up. Carla lifted the axe up above her head and brought it crashing down into the gurgling body. The noise stopped. But she did it again and again. And the pickaxe drove hard into Jerry's body. Blood splattered across the bed, the walls, and the ceiling. As Danny came back in the room, he saw what Carla had done. He took the axe from her, shaking. But he dealt one final blow, driving the spike deep into Jerry's chest. When he was happy that Jerry was dead, Danny left to continue filling his car with stolen goods. He handed the pickaxe back to Carla before he went. She stood in the bedroom holding the murder weapon. There was no more gurgling sounds. But then Carla noticed another noise. Breathing. And it wasn't Jerry. It wasn't her. It wasn't Danny or the other guy, Librant. Someone else. Someone else indeed. Well, now, is it, this is where, you know, this is where you have to question, hey, were you crazy the whole time? Because this situation here seems more of a murder, less of a robbery. Okay, due to the fact that both of them were so willing to just kill the guy. To simply attack him. Rather than sneak around the house, sneak around the garage. Isn't that typically how a robbery works? Uh, a B and E, if you will. Crazy stuff here, folks. Hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. Uh, I like to sort of analyze it between you get it it doesn't matter uh, this is you've got murder it's what's expected but let's proceed someone else was in the room they were hiding under the bed covers all tangled up against the wall Carla grabbed a hold of the pickaxe and felt the power surging It felt good. The woman scrambled to get free. Her name was Deborah Thornton. Her name was Deborah Thornton. She met Jerry the night before at a party. Deborah tried to escape the tangle of sheets, but she was stuck. That's when Carla swung that. That's when Carla swung the axe. Debbie ducked just in time. The two women fought, locked together in a blood-soaked struggle. Carla had no room to swing her axe. Debbie was fighting for her life. That's when Danny returned. He separated the two women, pulling them apart. That just meant that Carla had room to swing. And this time, she didn't miss. She hit Debbie square in the chest. Then she hit Debbie repeatedly later, confessing that each thud of the heavy axe into the woman's chest felt almost orgasmic. With a final blow, he drove the point of the pickaxe deep into Debbie's heart. Carla left the axe buried in the body. Together with Danny and Lybrand, she packed up anything worth stealing and drove off into the night. As the killer spent... As the killer sped away with the blood-soaked apartment. As the killer sped away, the blood-soaked. 
As the killer sped away, the blood-soaked apartment with the two dead bodies was left behind. The next morning, one of Debbie's co-workers approached. She'd been waiting for a ride, and Debbie told her where to meet. After knocking on the apartment door, she went inside and found a horrifying scene. Straight away, she ran and called the police. Detectives arrived on the scene to find Jerry beaten to death with horrendous injuries to the back of his head and his chest punctured by 20 blows from a pickaxe. And they didn't have to look far for the murder weapon. All right, so it's pretty obvious, I think, at this point that the lady's crazy. Every blow was orgasmic. I mean, what do we... What? So you're telling me that this was just because Jerry gurgled a bit? Flipped a switch in her, and all of a sudden, now I want to be a murderer? No, they went in there with the purpose of robbing the guy at the very least, and she was kind of the aggressor. She was the one that left on the guy, and he fought back. Such a uh, crazy story. I'm surprised I haven't heard more of this because also an interesting weapon, you know? And then the fact that the second person nearly escaped. Not because she was winning a, a fight against this lady, but the fact that she was hiding so well. But she had to go through all of that. I'm sure it was a short span of time, but it must have felt like forever. And then she ends up fighting the lady. I don't know. It would suck to be found. It would suck to have this happen for sure, but imagine almost getting away. Crazy. We got a little bit more. Let's finish. The murder weapon was still in Debbie's chest. It didn't take long to figure out that this was no ordinary murder. It was headline news across the country, but it still took five weeks for the police to track down the killers. The breakthrough came when Danny's brother and Carla's sister turned the pair into the police. Danny's brother even wore a wire when talking to his brother, extracting the confession. And once Carla had been found guilty of the murder and sentenced to death, a strange thing happened. While in jail, she claimed to have converted to Christianity, and she claimed to have seen the error of her ways. Carla went on to appeal many times, but her conversion to Christianity did nothing to commute the sentence. On the day of her execution, hours before Carla was set to die, she ate her last meal. She asked for a banana, a peach, and a salad with ranch dressing. Meanwhile, the then governor of the state, George W. Bush, refused an 11th hour appeal. Four people were invited to her execution. Her sister, her husband, her friend, and Ronald Carlson. Carla Tucker was killed by lethal injection February 3rd, 19... 19- 